This is Real Estate Rookie episode 362. Today, we are doing a rookie reply to answer your questions. We have questions about getting an evergreen loan and learning what that actually is. We are going to talk about making the best use of your rental property with exterior backyard upgrades and how to determine that those will be the best upgrades for your property in your market. We're also going to touch on a HELOC and also what to do if your credit is not that great and how to start investing before fixing your credit. I'm your host, Ashley Kerr, and I'm here with your other host, Tony J. Robinson. And welcome to the Real Estate Rookie Podcast, where every week, twice a week, we bring you the inspiration, motivation, and stories you need to hear to kickstart your investing journey. And like Ashley said today, we've got a slate of amazing questions lined up for you. So we're going to talk about a HELOC, a home equity line of credit. So we have great questions coming in today. In the HELOC, we're going to describe exactly what that is and what questions to ask a lender when you're considering getting a HELOC. The next thing we're going to touch on is an evergreen loan. Have you ever heard of this type of loan? We're also going to talk about what the difference is between an evergreen loan and what a HELOC is. And there's also some similarities. Then we're going to go into improvements that can pay off big by increasing your rent on your property or your daily rate on a short-term rental property. But at first, we're going to talk about the bad credit, but you may have a sizable down payment. So with this question, we're going to navigate how to go through this tricky scenario and help you decide where to start in your investing journey if you have this issue. Okay, our first question today is from Ivy C. I'm new to the real estate game and looking to invest. I have 15,000 in cash, but bad credit. Is there an avenue that I should look into while my credit is being fixed? What a great question as to Mm -hmm. you have part of the puzzle piece, but you're missing another piece to actually go to a bank and to get a loan. When I first started real estate investing, I had this limited mindset that I could only purchase properties in cash. I didn't even know that you could go to a bank and to finance a property. Fortunately, there are multiple different ways to actually purchase a property. So if there is something you are missing, like good credit or cash or experience or whatever it may be, there are multiple options to actually get you into a deal. So Tony, what would be your first recommendation to do with that 15,000? Yeah, I, I think one of the first things we should touch on actually is just like, how does how does bad credit impact rookies as they're looking to buy that first investment property? Um, I, I wouldn't say, you know, depending on how bad bad is, right? Bad is somewhat subjective, but depending on where your score is at, a, a lower score doesn't necessarily stop you, but it will make it more expensive, right? So the, the higher your credit score, typically you're gonna get a better interest rate Potentially, you're going to qualify for a lower down payment. So just the the cost of the debt is going to be cheaper if you've got good credit. The lower your credit score gets, typically the higher your interest rate is going to be. They might tack on additional like closing costs, fees, things like that. Your down payment might not be able to get as low as someone with a stronger credit score, depending on what kind of... Um, credit score you have. And then there, there are some banks that might just not want to work with you at all, right? You might just be unbankable depending on how low that credit score gets. So I, I think the first thing is just trying to make sure that folks understand why a good credit score is important as a rookie. Now, the, I guess the second piece and kind of tying into to your question here, Ash, before we even answer this question, I think we should ask Ivy, like, did you fix what led to the bad credit? Because if if that issue is still lingering, whether it was poor habits or or maybe you were, I don't know, there was some big financial issue and you haven't solved that yet. Maybe you lost your job, whatever it may be. Did you fix that issue first? Because if you didn't, I would be nervous to step into buying that rental property that's you know maybe several hundred thousand dollars uh, and not having any type of financial security in case things go wrong. Now, I, I don't know. What are, what are your thoughts on that that first step, Ash? Yeah, definitely. I think looking at why, what happened with your credit. So if you are behind on payments, uh, obviously use that 15,000 to help you get caught up. If you have overused your uh, credit cards, so credit card utilization is a big thing that actually impacts your credit. So if you have completely maxed out your credit cards, maybe using some of that money to buy that down, having a strong personal financial foundation 
will help you be a better investor because you are going to buy a property and you're going to have to manage the finances on that property. If you can't even manage your own, this is a great stepping stone to make sure you have your own finances in order before you go ahead. So with me personally, I had student loan debt, I had farm equipment debt, and I started investing even though I had that. I had great credit. I was paying those, but I actually used my cash flow to pay those loans off. So I don't want to us to sound like Dave Ramsey where, oh, you have to fix your credit. You have to pay off all your debt. Then you can mm-hmm. invest because, no, you can help pay down your debt or different things to help you do simultaneously while you're investing. But credit should be something that you should be working on as you're investing. But there is, there is that issue for the reason that your credit was impacted. See if that 15000 would be more valuable to correcting that issue and making sure going forward, it's not going to be an issue again that you'll be able to stabilize it. What do you think? What would be the first thing that comes to mind if you have 15000 You don't really have the option to go to the bank and get conventional lending because you're not approved or in some circumstances, they could offer you something different that just are not great terms, not a great Mm -hmm. interest rate, not a great repayment plan. So what's the first thing that comes to mind, Tony? I think the first thing I'd want to know from Ivy is like, what exactly is the, the goal for investing? Are you looking for consistent monthly cash flow, Ivy? Are you looking for just like a big chunk of cash? Do you want long-term appreciation? Are you, are you looking for certain tax benefits? Like what is the goal that you have behind investing in real estate? And I think that would dictate in a major way what steps are kind of, I guess, make the most sense for you. So uh, let me give an example. Say, Ivy, that your goal was um, maybe long-term appreciation. And let's say you live in a market that um, maybe like California, right? Maybe you're not in Los Angeles, but you're like in the suburbs where I am. For you, if the goal is appreciation, then maybe you want to go out and buy uh, a single family home that you're going to live in, knowing that, okay, 15 years or 10 years down the road, I'm going to sell this or or refinance this or do something else. I'm going to move out of this house so it becomes an investment vehicle. Now you've got 10 years worth of equity built up into that home. And now you can go in with maybe, you know, some kind of FHA or, or first time home buyer, some kind of low down payment loan product to get into that property, knowing that you don't really need anything from it for the next 10 years. On the flip side, let's say that your, your goal is cash flow. Like, hey, I, I want a cash flow today. Like I, I want the additional income. Then maybe you're, you're going out and you're looking for like a small multifamily where you're going to be able to take that 15,000, put it towards some of your down payment, maybe some repairs in, in the other unit or, or two units. And now you're using that to kind of kickstart your investing journey. So I think a lot of it comes down to what is the the goal that you've got, Ivy, and then trying to identify the best strategy based on that goal. I think one thing too, with that 15,000, there's an opportunity to partner with someone, maybe mm-hmm. somebody who does have good credit or maybe has some cash, but not enough, but together you know, you do have enough cash to purchase a property. Maybe you're doing paying for the rehab and they're paying for the property. So an opportunity for a partnership uh, could definitely be a stepping stone is finding that right person where all of what you guys can bring to the, the table kind of fits together to make that deal happen. Um, also, you could be a private money lender with that 15000 you know, de- obviously depending on the market, things like that. But for me, 15000 could cover a simple rehab on a property where you could be the private money lender on a, a, for the rehab portion of the property, at least too. And that could be a way to get your money working for you while you fix your credit to go and buy your own property if you don't want to partner with somebody. I think the last piece too is like, think about what types of real estate investing don't necessarily look at your credit score. Like we, we had Nate Robbins on episode 326 and he gave uh, a phenomenal breakdown for rookies to listen to when it comes to finding and sourcing off market deals. And you could do that for way less than $15,000. Like Nate, I'm pretty sure did it for free, right? He drove around, uh, drove for dollars, found a list of properties, called those, those owners, um, and use that list to start generating revenue by wholesaling those to other investors. So if the credit is a big obstacle, start looking at types of real estate activities, investing that don't require credit scores to get started. Okay. We're going to move on to our next question from Diane E. 
So Diane's question is, I've decided to get a HELOC on my primary home to fund my first property. What are some questions to ask when calling banks? Anything specific I need to know about the process? Do I call every bank possible? Okay, so I think first let's kind of break that down there as to this is on her primary home. So this is where Diane is living now. This isn't an investment property. You can definitely get a line of credit on investment property, but they are two totally different loan products and there's different information, different questions. So for this one, we're going to focus on the HELOC, the home equity line of credit for your primary residence. So looks like Diane is looking to get this HELOC to use those funds to invest into a, a, a rental property or into real estate somehow. So she's wondering what questions to call when asking banks and how to find the best HELOC product that there is. Okay. So, um, I actually did type out a couple, uh, questions here, Tony, that came, uh, top of mind to me. So the first thing though, that I wanted to respond to is, do I call every bank possible? I think we should address that before we even get into the questions, because I, first of all, we love small local banks. So any bank you already have a relationship with and by relationship is you have a checking account with them. You have a credit card with them, whatever that may be. Maybe you have a job where you, you know, do loans for someone or you have some kind of interaction at a bank. You're making bank deposits there for your job or whatever it may be. Definitely add those to the list and then look in your area for other small local banks that you can um, contact. But My recommendation, instead of calling them, would actually be to email them. You can go on the websites. You can look at the loan officer of the closest bank branch to you. And this way, you can write out your questions. You can write out what you're trying to do, which would be to pull money out of your property without actually refinancing, because maybe they actually have a different option for you than doing a home equity line of credit. So kind of leave it open-ended where you're not telling them exactly what you want. And then this way you can write it out and you can just copy and paste it and send it out to all of them. And then you also have their responses in writing. So you can go ahead and it's much easier to compare than keeping track of phone calls. You know, you got your three kids running around, you got dinner on the stove and you're trying to fold laundry and you get the loan officer calling you say, Hey, I'm responding, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then you're like, I don't even know what bank they were calling from at the end of the phone call. So I like to have it all in writing. And then also you can keep track of, you know, who's returning your call in a timely manner. You want a loan officer who's going to be responsive because then your loan is just going to move faster. So um, that's why I prefer the email process. And it's so much easier than taking the time to call everyone and waiting for those return calls to come in if you don't get them on the first try. So Tony, anything to add to that before we go through the list of questions? No, I, I, I totally love that approach, Ash, of, of sending out the emails. Um, I feel like you you definitely leverage your time the best way. But I would say also, to, like if you're close enough, Diane, I, I do like to go inside to the, the, the branches as well. Um, because I, I don't know, sometimes I just feel like if you're close enough, you can have that conversation face to face. People are just a little bit more... I don't know. It becomes a little bit more conversational. Maybe things come up mm-hmm. that wouldn't have come up, come up during that email thread. Um, but Ash, I think before we dive into your questions, maybe let's just define exactly what a HELOC is for those rookies that maybe aren't super familiar with that phrase. Um, so HELOC, it's H-E-L-O-C, all capital letters, and it stands for Home Equity Line of Credit. Um, so when you're trying to tap into the equity of your home, you've pretty much got like three different options. You can sell your property, right? And that's going to unlock all of the equity that you have minus closing costs. You can refinance your property where you're replacing your original mortgage with a new mortgage, and then you get to keep the difference between those two mortgage amounts. Or you can get a home equity line of credit where you're keeping your original mortgage in place, but you're almost, you're like basically getting a second mortgage that's really focused just on that equity piece. So for a lot of people um, who have, you know, especially if you bought like in 2020, you know, in that time frame, you got like a below 3% interest rate. Maybe you don't want to refinance. HELOCs are, are a good way to still tap into that equity. Now, one thing I want to say, Ash, before we jump into your questions here is that, you know, you, you hear people like Grant Cardone say that your your primary home isn't an investment. But I know countless people who have used HELOCs 
just like Diane is talking about, to go out and fund their first real estate investment. Or I, I met a couple where they had one primary home. They had fixed it up themselves, pulled out a bunch of equity with with a uh, with a HELOC, and they just bird a bunch of homes in the Midwest, like over and over and over again, all with that one chunk of cash from that HELOC. And they built up, you know, like a double digit portfolio in the Midwest only with the money from their HELOC. So if you use it the right way, it definitely is a, a smart option. So I didn't mean to go off the rails here. I just wanted to define that phrase for folks who maybe aren't familiar with it. No, I think that was great. Um, definitely a, a great little breakdown there of what a HELOC is and how powerful of a tool it is. Because even if some people do say your home, your primary residence is not an investment, it is still an asset mm -hmm. than a liability. So, mm -hmm. okay. So some of the questions I had written out is, first of all, how long is the line of credit good for? So is a good for five years, 10 years, how long until the bank says you were closing down your line of credit and we need to, if you want to reopen it, we have to go through the same steps, run your credit again. We have to do a new appraisal, things like that. So is there an expiration date on the line of credit? Um, the next thing is, do they charge for an appraisal? So usually with the conventional mortgages or all mortgages, you are on the hook for that closing cost for paying the appraisal. But oftentimes for a line of credit, the bank will actually cover that cost for you. And there are little to none closing costs to actually get a, a line of credit. So that's one question to ask is, do they cover the appraisal costs? And also, what are your closing costs that you will be responsible for during the process? And then... Um, does another appraisal need to be done at a certain point point in time? So is your line of credit good for however long? And then do you have to have a second appraisal at a certain point to make sure that your property has maintained the value that your property um, that they're lending on? And then also, how do you withdraw the funds? So will you be getting a checkbook where you can just write a check whenever? Uh, for a couple of my line of credits, it's actually kind of inconvenient. One of them, I have to fill out a form and then I have to email it to the loan officer and then they'll deposit it into my account. That can take 24 to 48 hours before that actually happens. And then um, for another one, I just email the loan officer and he deposits it into the account. I don't have to fill out a certain form or anything. But still, it's not as convenient as actually writing a check and having it, you know, on demand. The next thing would be, is the line of credit callable? So that kind of goes with, is there an expiration date or at a certain time period, do the, the loan actually go into an amortization period? So say you've had the line of credit for two years, you withdrew $100,000 and you've just been paying the interest. After a certain amount of time, does the bank actually step in and say, we're going to amortize the 100000 you owe over 15 years and now you're paying principal and the interest too. So finding out when that is or does it just go into perpetuity that you don't have to pay and it's going to be interest only forever until you die. And then your kids actually owe the whole balance. <laughs> <laughs> those are all, those are really, really good questions, Ash. I've never done a HELOC on my primary residence before, so I haven't personally gone through that process. But if I were, and I'm curious what your thoughts are here. Um, if I were to use a HELOC, I feel like my preference would be to use it for a short-term investment versus a long-term investment. Because when you when you have a HELOC, you have the option, like you could use it for a down payment on a property that, you know, that, that investment property you're gonna have for 30 years, whatever it may be. And you could just use that HELOC for that down payment. Now you have to factor in not only paying your mortgage on that investment property, but now also repaying the HELOC on a monthly basis, uh, which, which could kind of eat into the margins that you have on that deal. The other option is you can do with that, you know, that my, my couple friend that I talked about that re-leveraged their HELOC over and over again, where you use it on a short-term basis, where you're going out and you're basically burying properties, right? You're buying them uh, either with a combination of hard money or maybe your HELOC covers the entire uh, purchase plus the rehab. You rehab the property, you refinance, and then when you refinance, you just pay back your HELOC so the, the balance is back down to zero. Then you find the next property, you start that whole process all over again. But now you're only leveraging the HELOC for maybe three to six months, as opposed to locking it into a property that you're going to have for, for 30 years. What's your take on that, Ash? I mean, do you like it for long-term use or do you prefer to use it for the short-term stuff as well? I 100% like it for the short-term use. And that's what I do. It's usually to purchase the property in cash because it's so much easier than having to get money from somewhere else because it's literally mm -hmm. me just saying, yes, here's the money <laughs> I buying this property. 
And then also for the rehab, we usually never, ever get private money for rehab. We usually use that from the line of credits and then we don't have to do draws from hard money or anything like that. And it's just so much more convenient to use our own money for that. But um, so in the short term, and then when we go refinance, we're paying that back, paying off the line of credit, and then it sits and it waits for us to purchase the next property. So one thing I have seen people do with this is they will use the line of credit for their down payment. So if they're going and they're purchasing a property using, you know, bank financing and they have to put a down payment on and they're doing, you know, a 30 year fixed rate, it's not like they're planning on refinancing. They do have a plan in place to rapidly pay off that down payment. So where they're going, they're not looking for any cash flow up front. Like they're expecting that over this next six months, the next year, they know from their W-2 job and from the little cash flow from this investment property, they're going to be able to pay off that line of credit for their down payment in six months, in a year, and then they will have cash flow on the property and that line of credit will be paid Mm -hmm. off. So that is something I've seen people do because it expedites them investing instead of them waiting six months or waiting a year to actually save for the full down payment. They're accessing the line of credit, knowing that they're going to be making those big lump chunk payments um, to their line of credit over that time period. But the important part is to know, like to make sure that you can afford to pay back your line of credit because the line of credit payments are interest only usually. So those are very low and that's not your payment. You need to pay that principal back and just letting that principal sit there, even though you can pay the interest only for three, four years or however long your line of credit is for, you want to make sure that you start paying down that that principal and you have a plan in place if you are going to use it, the, the funds for a down payment. So what we just talked about is actually going to relate a little bit into our next question about evergreen loans from Charlotte L. So Charlotte's question is, the banker suggested an evergreen loan to assist with purchasing additional properties. Never heard of that type of loan until then. I searched online to learn more, but would like to know the pros and cons some of you may have experienced with this type of loan. And this is why I love having open-ended conversations with loan officers instead of saying, this is exactly what I want, is giving them the opportunity to present to you these things you didn't even know existed and learning Mm -hmm. about them. So when we touch on an evergreen loan, some of the similarities you will notice will just be like a line of credit as we just went over in our last question, the home equity line of credit. The difference with an evergreen loan is that it operates similar to a line of credit, but it is forever revolving and it has no expiration date on it until you, the borrower or the lender decides to close down the loan. So think of a credit card as an example. You open your credit card and that balance is just on there revolving. Or if you pay it, you know, pay it off every month, your, what's the word I'm looking for? How much your- Your spending limit? Your spending Uh, limit, spending (laughs) limit. There we go. Um. Everyone knows this is the universal sign for spending limit if you're watching on YouTube. (laughs) So with your spending limit, it's continuously revolving. So if you spend, you know, $300 one month and your spending limit is 10 grand, you know, that you pay that off that month, the next month you still have that 10 grand and it's forever revolving. So that's kind of an example of how it works. So an evergreen loan is something you could get from the bank to purchase a property where they're giving you the line of credit where you can make interest only payments on it. You can pay off some of the principal. You can pay a little of the principal as time goes on. And then it's up to you to actually close the the loan if you're not going to be using it anymore. Where a line of credit, as we touched on, can have an expiration date where it can say, okay, in two years, you have to reapply for your line of credit. Or if you haven't paid the balance off at year three, we're going to actually turn it into an amortization schedule where you're going to have to pay the loan back over 15 years of whatever the balance is on the the line of credit at that time. All great points, Ashley. I think the only thing that I would add to you for the evergreen loan is that, and I'm sure it might vary from lender to lender, but uh, it sounds like majority of the time, this isn't going to be necessarily tied 
um, to the equity of your primary residence. So as where, you know, with the last question with Diane, she was putting up the equity in her primary home to get this debt with the Evergreen loan. Um, again, might vary, but it's looking at you and your uh, bankability, your credit worthiness, and it's using that to kind of guide, um, or I guess to secure the loan and not necessarily your, your home. Um, uh, the other thing too, that uh, just maybe to, to consider Charlotte is, since it's not secured by a hard asset like real estate, Typically, those types of debts, uh, those types of loans are, are a little bit more expensive. So you might want to shop to, to kind of understand what the rates are. Right? What kind of interest are you paying? You know, is it single digits or, or is it, you know, 20s? Um, so just making sure you understand what the cost of the debt is, given that it's not uh, secured by real estate. It's not backed by real estate. Okay. Our next question is from Luke P. What are the best value adds, if any, to a backyard for a buy and hold duplex? Have you found it worthwhile with a return through increased rent or appreciation to add a deck or a patio? TIA, thanks in advance. Okay, so Tony, let's start with short-term rentals. Mm -hmm. What are you doing to add value? Because I have been to one of your summits and Sarah got the whole room chanting over this one value <laughs> ad that you guys do. So uh, I know you definitely have backyard ideas. Yeah. So I, I think, but before I even jump into that, I, I think Luke, the, one of the biggest things I can share with you is to, to use data to help make this decision. So look at comps in your area, um, both, like you said, both for you know homes that have recently sold and for properties that are currently for rent. And just start comparing what are the things that those listings have that mine don't <laughs> that I should probably consider adding to my property. When you, when you make that comparison, it starts to become super clear when you look at 10, 20, 30 different properties. Like, okay, in the backyard, the majority of these homes for rent have a, I don't know, a swing set for the kids or the majority of these properties have uh, a shed for tool storage, whatever it may be. But you'll start to see trends as you look at comparable properties in your market. And that's a really strong indicator of what people want and what they're willing to pay for. Now, in terms of what we do for our properties, um, you know, short-term rentals are, I think, are a slightly different beast than, um, than, than traditional long-term rentals because a lot of the revenue potential for a short-term rental is tied to the experience of the guest. So there, there are big things we've done. There are little things we've done. And I'm, I'm going to share some things, both backyard and, and non-backyard. But I, I think what you really want to look for, Luke, is what are those things that have high impact, but hopefully low cost? So we, we rehabbed a home last summer. And when we bought the home, it was a one bedroom, uh, one bath property, but it was a massive one bedroom. Like this lady had knocked down the walls between two of the bedrooms to make just like one massive master suite. And then she knocked down the walls for what was a third bedroom to make it like kind of like a, a loft office type area. So on paper with the county, it was still a three bedroom, but physically it was a, it was a one bed with a, with an office. So when we came back in, obviously from an appraisal standpoint, a one bed with an office is going to appraise for significantly less than a three bedroom. So we went in, we re up all three bedrooms again, and then we added a second bathroom. So we took what was, you know, when you walked in, what was essentially a one, one, we turned it into a three, two. And that allowed us to really increase the value of that home, both from the appraisal standpoint and from the actual like rental revenue, because now we've got three bedrooms and two baths as opposed to one and one. What we're doing in the backyard for that property is a good example as well. We noticed that for a lot of properties in Joshua Tree, pools are a desired amenity, but they're not all that common because they're expensive to install. They take a lot of time. And, you know, it, it's just there, there's a higher barrier of entry for installing an in-ground pool than there is for doing a hot tub or doing an above-ground pool. So when we bought this property, we said, okay, what can we do to really make ourselves stand out? And we landed on the pool because we looked at all the other top performing three bedrooms in that market and the vast majority had in-ground pools. So that was our cue to say, okay, we need to do the same thing. So we, we started construction on that uh, maybe two months ago, uh, and hopefully we're going to be done by the end of this month. Um, but we're hoping that'll really help take this listing to the next level. So that's, I know, long-winded Luke, but that's, that's kind of my approach. Use your comps, look for those high impact, low cost ideas as well. As far as uh, long-term rentals, uh, the couple things that come to mind, well, the first thing is a shed. So mm -hmm. having a place that residents can store their, you know, 
outside things like kids' toys, tires, tools, shelves, like whatever things that they don't want in their house that they have from maybe the last property. Maybe they owned a house and have some belongings they want to bring with them or lawn furniture, whatever. Having a shed is a huge value add. And what you can do is you can actually increase the rent. Like say, if you would like to use the shed, it's $25 a month. Paying $25 a month for a shed is way cheaper than them having to drive to a storage facility, put their stuff in there. They're going to pay way more and it's not going to be convenient. And having items that are convenient for your residents will definitely increase the value. And storage, storage, storage is always great. So putting a shed on and make sure you check with your town and make sure if you have to get a permit for a shed, but you can buy really cheap sheds, just like plastic ones at Home Depot, Lowe's, or you can actually go like around here. We get a lot of Amish built sheds that are also really affordable, but they're made out of wood and sturdier and you can put those on the property too. And then building a garage this is obviously way more of an expense than putting a shed on, but having a garage, you can charge extra for the garage. They can park their car in there and they can also store items in there. So right now to the apartment complexes that I manage, they each have um, garages that come with them. And there is a huge waiting list for garages and you have to pay extra for the garage. But that is one item that residents really want, because especially if you're living in, you know, it's not a single family home. It's, you know, two to four units or a larger. You have common areas with other residents where if you're in a single family house, OK, if you store stuff on the side of the house or you store stuff in the entryway or the back of the house or on the porch, it's you're the only person living there. But when it's a shared property with other residents, you can't just throw your stuff in the common area. So there's more of a need, especially in uh, Luke's example of having a duplex for those separate uh, storage places. And then the other thing I put down was he asked specifically about a having a, a deck or a patio on the back. And I definitely think this is a value add, but I would go with a patio because a patio is less maintenance where a deck wear and tear over the time you have to stain it or maintain it, the wood somehow. And a deck, you have to have it built out structurally. You have to get a permit where with a patio, oftentimes you don't even need a permit. You could put down pavers. You can have a small, a small concrete pad, you know, filled. So I would definitely go with a patio over a deck because it gives the same kind of value where they can put, you know, a table outside on it, a grill, things like that. Um, really can't charge extra for those amenities. I, there probably is somebody that does like, hey, you can't use your back deck unless you pay extra. But yeah. so that's why I like the shed better. But um, definitely you do. I would like the patio over the deck just because I've seen the maintenance that a deck can have over a patio. In the patio, you just have to seal it every couple of years or so. Ash, have you have you found like, okay, we need to have this amenity or this value add at every single property? Like now it's just a staple. Like we've had some of those for, for our short-term rentals. Like what is that for you? Is it the shed that you're like, okay, every single listing needs that? Or, or yeah, have you identified anything like that? It's off-street parking. Huh. That is, it is so hard to rent out a property that doesn't have off street parking in the areas that I'm investing at least. Yeah. So street parking is just not desirable to anyone. And I, I can't blame them. <laughs> so, um, but also it, it is, it can be difficult to have a property with a shared driveway where there's room for, you know, three to four cars, but you're parked tail end to tail end. So mm -hmm. we had this issue before at one property where, you know, the downstairs person, the upstairs person worked opposite shifts and they'd be banging on the door for the guy to move his car and things like that. So as a landlord, you don't want to have those issues. You want to prevent as many tenant disputes as you possibly can. But that could actually be another value add if you do have a large backyard is adding another parking space because <laughs> parking is always a huge value add. And most families nowadays have more than one car or two cars, sometimes three cars. So uh, yeah, parking is definitely a huge value add that I see that with every property is definitely a benefit to have. Yeah, I never, never would have thought of parking. I, but I, you know, I, you know, when I lived in apartments for a little while after college, um, you know, some units didn't have garages. So even just like the paid parking stalls, you know, so say that you in that scenario, maybe you only had two stalls for a four unit. 
it's the person who wants to pay more that, that gets those parking spots as well, right? Yeah. So yeah, um, yeah. I guess lots of different ways to add some value. Look, we just gave you a lot of ideas, man. So you, you got a you got a lot to go play with now. Okay, well, thank you guys so much for joining us for this week's Rookie Reply. I'm Ashley and he's Tony. If you have a question that you would like to submit, please go to biggerpockets.com slash reply. And we'll catch you guys on our next episode. 